Well, good morning, First Covenant. We, uh, we know that there are a lot of people who are on the road today and a lot of people who are coming in. So the people who are here, you are important and you matter. And uh, we want to raise a joyful noise to the Lord. So raise it a little louder than usual today. But one of the things I love uh, when we come together and worship is I love hearing us sing together. It is a beautiful thing. So may it be a fragrant offering to the Lord this morning. So let's stand and let's worship him together. One. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. Come, all you here, now to His temple draw near. Draw me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord above all things so wondrously reigning. Sheltering you under his wings and so gently sustaining. Have you not seen all that his needful has been? Sent by his gracious ordained. Praise to the Lord who will prosper your work and defend you. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attend you. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. If with his love he be Praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people again. Gladly forever Forever adore Him, gladly forever adore Him, gladly forever adore Him. Please be seated. As I said, welcome. Good morning. You're at First Covenant Church. Um, I'm Pastor Evan. We are disciples who make disciples. Happy Father's Day to those watching online and in person. We're glad that you've joined us today. And we are grateful for our Heavenly Father, who is good and is good to us all the time. Um, if you're a guest this morning, uh, please uh, grab a notebook at the back and let us know about your visit by going to our Sunday page online. And uh, a couple things upcoming and noteworthy for today and ahead. One is Sunday school is offered today for all ages. We have adults upstairs, as usual, kids downstairs with uh, movie discussions. Um, we also have the addition of the mission and ministry class today. For those who are newer to the congregation, that's over there through that door, if you're joining us for that. One thing that uh, came out this week, though, that I just want to put across your uh, horizon here right now, and we'll hear more about it next week, is there are some flyers in the back for five-day clubs. Child Evangelism Fellowship and Kids First uh, have partnered together to do these um, a couple times this summer, and then uh, Kids First is actually using some of the curriculum beyond that. Um, but I want to put it on your radar now because June 26th through 30th is the first one. Um, and this one is in the afternoon, 3 to 4.30. There's a little bit of it that functions a little like a vacation Bible school, but not quite. Um, and Child Evangelism Fellowship will have people there to work but they've asked that we actually send some folks down to volunteer too, which I think would be great to be able to experience that and, and join into what's going on. So it's very evangelistic. Uh, that's in the name, very biblical 
uh, in curriculum, uh, teaching, singing, all the fun stuff. Um, so if that's at all of interest to you, just put it on your calendar now. Grab a flyer in the back so you can uh, mark that. And we have a representative from CEF coming next Sunday to tell us a little more and kind of uh, let us know if you have further questions what's involved in that. You can sign up that way or even let me know today if you want to be a part of it. The other thing I wanted to note is um, uh, we recognize that uh, this coming Monday is uh, many of you have off for Juneteenth. And uh, that's one of those that is a, in some ways a, a new holiday in being recognized officially. But, um, you know, this was a moment when slaves didn't know they were free. And all of a sudden they found out. And I think there's something important, one, to recognize that in our national uh, uh, history, but there's also something important to recognize that when we hear God's word. That sometimes we think we're free when we're not. And I pray this morning and going forward that we continue to hear God's word, recognizing God's freedom offered to us when sometimes we're not free. So maybe we'd be open to God's word that we would receive his invitation to freedom. Let's continue to worship. Let's stand together. Excuse me, I'm supposed to do this first. I'll read the, fir the words on top. You read the words on bottom. Oh, God, the Holy Spirit. Welcome to us and among us. Oh, God, the Holy Spirit. Come as the way and between us. Oh, God, the Holy Spirit. Come as the fire and burn. Oh, God, the Holy Spirit. Come as the dew and the bread. Oh, God, the Holy Spirit. To our great good and our and your greater glory. And, and this, this we ask for Jesus Christ. With your heart and lead me 
I trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. I will bear my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you. Our scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 46. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Almoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. You are rainmaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are rainmaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, man in every yard. I worship you, I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. 
For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, you are, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Bob forward for our congregational prayer today. Good morning. We're going to spend just a little time in prayer together. So I'd ask you this morning, if while I pray here, would you be praying to God also at the same time? We'll have lots of prayers going up all at once. Let's pray together. Father, on this special day, we are remembering our fathers. We remember that you are our father too. We're all thankful for the model you have set for us as fathers and for our fathers here on earth. We're thankful that you have w welcomed us and shown us your love for each of us as well as for all the world's people. We're thankful that you are faithful and loving to each of us, even though oftentimes we are not even aware of it. We remember and are thankful for our own fathers here on earth and for the love and caring that we receive from them. Even though we as fathers and our own fathers are not perfect as you are, we are thankful that we have you to follow and learn from as our example. Please be our reminder as fathers and mothers and children today to follow your example and to love and cherish our families as you have loved and cherished them. Encourage us to be faithful in little practices of love of little sacrifices that will grow and become normal in our lives. Help us to be fathers and parents that make it easy for our children to love us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bob. We um, are going to receive our offering at this time this morning. And uh, while we receive it, we're going to sing a an old revival song from the covenant world that many of you may know, many of you probably don't actually. So you can listen, you can sing along. There's a lot of words that come very fast, but they're good words. So as we receive our offering, may these, uh, may these words of truth um, wash over you this morning.
Oh, let your soul now be filled with gladness, your heart redeemed, rejoice indeed. Oh, may the thought banish all your sadness, that in his blood you have been freed. That God's unfailing love is yours, that you the only son were given. That by his death he has opened heaven, that you are ransomed as you are. If you seem empty of any feeling, rejoice you are his ransom bride. For those who cherish seem not to love you, and dark assails from every side. Still yours a promise, come what may, in lots of triumph and laughter crying. In wanted riches and living dying, that you are purchased as you are. It is a good, every good transcending, that Christ has died for you and me. It is a gladness that has no ending, there in God's wondrous love to see. Praise be to you, O spotless Lamb, who through the desert my soul are leading. To that fair city of joy exceeding, for which you bought me as I am. As I'm getting in place here, I want to remind our kids that, yes, there are still prizes afterwards, and I hope you got your children's bulletin. Come up and see me afterwards, and we'll see what, uh, what you came up with. It's always fun to see. Uh, we're in the book of 1 Timothy. I invite you to find 1 Timothy. Follow along. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. This will continue from where we started last week, um, so a lot of the same stuff um, that comes up in tying into this idea of being spiritually healthy, which I think is, is behind what's going on here. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 17. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. As I said, we're rooting this as we look at 1 Timothy and the idea that a healthy diet of truth and love nourishes the disciple of Christ. And there's a healthy diet of that that Paul is spooning up throughout the letter of 1 Timothy. We see the problems, but what we're looking for as we look through this is where we find joy and life in Christ as his people. And so we saw the problem beginning last week uh, in the passages just before this where we see false doctrine, false teaching that's going on within the church in Ephesus. It comes in the form of the myths and the genealogies that we can see. And the way those might come across, as far as we can tell uh, from what scholars can piece together, because we don't exactly know what those are, but we have some ideas, um, is that they'd come across as speculation. So that's a fancy word for guess, right? They'd come across as half-truths, so where people fill in the details of stories and things that we know that are true, 
but then fill it in with stuff that we know is not true or aren't sure if it's true, then it makes you question everything. Or they come in the, the form of unanswered questions, so people kind of pushing a little bit at what is true, but just asking questions here, but not really any direction to go with it, so they're not building up the faith of another, they're really tearing it down and building themselves up at the same time. Seems like that's the way it's going, and what that pre presents for the body of Christ is chaos. That's what, that's what it does for them, that's the net effect. Um, in verse 6, Paul says, all of this that's going on, this aiming at false doctrine and all that's there, is meaningless talk. It's not grounded in truth, and it's not grounded in love either. And so as we look through this, like I said, we see the problems in 1 Timothy. We're looking for the joy of the Lord and the joy in Christ that we see and the healthy spiritual diet that we need to take in in order to live that way. And I want to point that out as we can see that the net effect of all this is chaos because an important truth to remember is there's no joy in chaos. Chaos doesn't bring that. Chaos brings anxiety and all kinds of other things, but it doesn't bring joy. Uh, verse 4, it talks about these false teachers. Uh, chaos, in that case, doesn't advance God's work. These false teachers are there presenting this false case, and chaos doesn't, present, doesn't advance God's work. It holds it back. Verse 6, we saw the meaningless talk piece, or we mentioned that. And the reason it's meaningless talk, among many others, is that now the primary mission of advancing God's work becomes the secondary thing. And all the secondary stuff gets elevated to the primary stuff. So they get caught up in, in stuff. I, I think of the myths and genealogies kind of like in the Middle Ages when uh, there were a lot of schol scholastic scholars in Europe that thought that they'd answered all the important theological questions, so they started asking, you know, what color is Mary's hair and how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or something like that. And those become the most important questions. But those aren't the most important questions. When we start going down that route, that's what happens, though. And we start getting mission creep. That which is most important becomes less important, and less important becomes the most important. This meaningless talk. Verse 7 then we see, uh, and this is, this is important going on to advance Paul's argument, you know, these people want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they are talking about, he says, or what, or what they're even doing. And so chaos, in that case, leads to pride and arrogance on their part, because they can elevate themselves, but they're not doing any good for anybody else. But they can sound important, they can look important, and they end up not being concerned really about Christ and the work of God's work and good news getting out in the world, they're concerned about their own self-importance. Those are the problems, those are the effects of, of the chaos there. And if we're followers of Christ then, we don't live in chaos. We're to live in truth and love. And a life of truth and love leads towards clarity, not chaos. Now I want to point out, that doesn't mean everything gets clear the moment we follow Christ. Man, wouldn't that be nice, amen, right? Okay, Jesus, I come to you, now everything's clear. It's not. That's not the way it works. I wish it were. But it does mean that we're walking with the one who leads us to clarity and who makes things more clear as we walk with him. And that's an important thing to remember. In fact, I've been living very much with Jesus' final words to his disciples in Matthew 28 when he says, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We walk with the one who leads us towards clarity. Now, Paul, we're going to go kind of backwards to the end, closer to the end of our text and then come back to the beginning. Uh, in verse 15, I think this kind of holds the whole thing together, what we're seeing here. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. When he says, here's a trustworthy saying, we're actually going to see that phrase three times in the book of 1 Timothy, or the letter of 1 Timothy, but then he follows it up with three different phrases. Um, so, but they all, they relate, they're just not the same phrase. Here's a trustworthy saying, it's kind of a figure of speech, and it's a way of saying, you probably already know this information, maybe you've forgotten it, maybe you didn't write it down, but this is pretty important, so you should highlight this and remember it at this point. That's what he's saying. That's why he says it that way. And so we can already see when he says, here's a trustworthy saying, we should highlight it too, underline it, do whatever to remember it. 
we can already see some joy in the text there. That through Jesus, God rescues us from the chaos, corruption, and destruction of sin. Thanks be to God for that. Paul, though, if you go backwards then, verse 8, you know, he's making this move. So verse 7, he's saying these false teachers are trying to teach stuff from the law. They're trying to be important. They're not doing it. They're not doing a good job of it. Paul even points out, hey, I tried to do that kind of thing too. It didn't work. But he says, we know the law is good in verse 8 if one uses it properly. And so we recognize some things about the, the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law couldn't save, but it flagged the problem of what we needed to be saved from. That's what it did. So we can bring in some other words from Paul in Galatians. Uh, Galatians 2.21, Paul says, I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Same message. Galatians 3, 20, uh, 21 and 22, and then jumping to 24, Paul says, is the, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. So he advances this argument forward. It's, it, the law is good if one uses it properly, but it, of course it doesn't save us, we understand. It tells us what's wrong and why we need some kind of salvation or some kind of deliverance. And then he proceeds to list this listing that uh, functions as not an exhaustive list, but as a list that points to many more things that we could do. And it, it functions kind of like a mini Ten Commandments, actually, because it at least parallels Commandments 5 through 9 as it proceeds through there. And, and points, and, and the Ten Commandments aren't exhaustive either. They're just like the starting point. Here's all the stuff that could be wrong. And there could be other things that are under this heading. We don't want to do any of those. The law tells us we're not going to do any of those. I'm going to run through the list very quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But just to point out that connection, he says... We know that the lawbreakers, rebels, ungodly, sinful, unholy, and irreligious. They've broken the law, and frankly, we're probably all on that list somewhere, in some way, shape, or form. Right? We can find ourselves, not, even if we're not directly in the list, we're somewhere next to the list uh, in this. Some of them are worse, some are not as, seem not as bad, but we can find ourselves there. Then he says, those who kill father or mother. That relates to commandment five. Honor your father and your mother. It's the opposite of that. Those who murder relates to commandment six. Don't murder. That one's pretty straightforward. Now, the next ones, those who are sexually immoral, and my translation has those practicing homosexuality. Guaranteed your translation has something different. They all do. Relates to commandment seven, do not commit adultery, which had a broader heading uh, in their understanding. And I only want to make a little point about this um, because I think it's, it's obviously a present issue, and I want to make a point about the word that's used there um, so that we can look at how it needs to be translated correctly. Um, there are lots of imprecise translations out there. New Testament's written in Greek. This word, arsenakoites, comes from two words that many believe Paul compounded together. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but that's what's happened here. Arsen meaning males, koites meaning bed, but that's a euphemism for something else. Um, and it clearly parallels the language used in Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13, which talks about, we can paraphrase, a man should not lie with a man as he does a woman. That seems to be what Paul is paralleling in how he states this. So the best translation I've seen comes from the Christian Standard Bible, the most current one. But I'm going to use what Preston Sprinkle, Dr. Preston Sprinkle has translated because I think he's, it's almost the same. The best translation is men who sleep with males is what this says. Um, and we want to be precise in that because it's getting at the, the uh, specific behavior that's there. But I want to also recognize something important as well in this. Uh, the, Christ, the complete Jewish Bible, I think, puts together the meaning of what Paul's going for here. And again, these stand for more than just the direct thing it's talking about. The complete Jewish Bible translated the sexually immoral dash, both heterosexual and homosexual. And I point that out because sometimes we elevate certain sins over other sins within the body of Christ, and we need to be careful about doing that. If we're to be people of truth and love, sometimes we've been pretty good at being people of truth but not love on certain issues. We need to be people of truth and love, recognizing 
that this is a complex and complicated area we walk into. Continuing on in the list, it talks about slave traders. Literally, it's kidnappers. That relates to uh, commandment eight, do not steal. So obviously, this is not exhaustive because we could steal other things than people. Uh, liars and perjurers are the last things on my list. Uh, that relates to commandment nine. I think it relates to commandment 10 too. So commandment nine is do not bear false witness or testimony against your neighbor. Commandment 10, don't covet your neighbor's ox, people. That's what commandment 10 is. Now, obviously, other things too. But if we look at all that Paul is saying here, these teachers of the law don't know what they're doing. The law tells us that we're off course, that we're doing things that are outside of the sphere of what God desires for us, that we are in this category of, of the lawbreakers, the rebels, the ungodly, the sinful, the unholy, and the irreligious. We all find ourselves in that category in various ways. The joy of what we see in the text is the demands of the law are met in Christ. That's the good news that comes out of this. And I, I want to quote Warren Wearsby, the late Warren Wearsby, I think, says this so well of the connection between these two, commenting on this passage. He says, law and gospel go together, for the law without the gospel is diagnosis without remedy. But the gospel without the law is only the good news of salvation for people who don't believe it because they never heard the bad news of judgment. The law is not gospel, but the gospel is not lawless. I thought he stated that so well. And I think we can recognize even more joy in this, and I'm going to pull in Romans 8 because I think this adds to the, the portrait of what we see here, that the, that the demands of the law are met in Christ. Romans 8, Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, that just starts with good news right there, right? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I think there's a lot of joy to be seen there in the text. The law is fulfilled in Christ. He frees us from the penalty of living under that law. But there's also, and I recognize this, I, this is again from Warren Wearsby. I try not to read his stuff all that much. Actually, he was a friend of our congregation. Many of you knew him. Um, because his stuff's so preachable, I don't want to accidentally copy his stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't read it much. But when you do, I'm like, man, that's good stuff. Brother Wearsby did it. Here's the scary truth, and I'm going to paraphrase his thought. As we consider the Lord's patience, which we'll come to in this passage, and the way that Paul talks about, I was the worst, but he's also pointing out to the people in Ephesus and to us, hey, we're all kind of in this category of sinner, aren't we? We've all missed the mark. We're all really far off without Christ, and the law just tells us how far off we are. The scary truth, to paraphrase Wearsby, is before Christ, Paul was a religious man who did not pursue God's work. That's quite a thought, isn't it? He was a religious man. He looked the part. He did the stuff, but he wasn't actually doing God's work at all. Paul was like the chaos makers of 1 Timothy 1, 7. A teacher of the law who didn't know what he was talking about, but he sure looked the part. And it strikes me that we can bring that into our own context and maybe say it this way. Sometimes we can be very religious people and have no idea how to respond to the living God. I mean, all I can be too. All of us can be. God can do things, and we just don't know how to respond sometimes. We need a healthy spiritual diet, I think, to get on board and know what to do. And we need to receive Christ and, and accept that invitation and live with him and walk with him towards clarity to be able to understand how to respond to the living God. And so things happen in life sometimes. Bad things even happen. I've experienced it. You've experienced it. And, and people, believer or non-believer, will sometimes ask in those moments, where's God in this tough moment, in this hard time? And Paul tells us, 
not all the answers. I wish he did. But Paul tells us even at our worst moments, Jesus displays his immense patience with us so that we might respond to his mercy. That's what he's saying in verse 16. Even in, even in those times, God puts out his, his patience is so immense that even in those bad times, those hard times, those destructive times, it's his mercy that's extended to us through his patience that we might respond because there's an invitation even in those times to his mercy. And mercy, what I mean by that, it's a specific application of grace. It's extended to alleviate misery. And it's extended at a time when uh, we couldn't do something on our own. Somebody gives you mercy, it's because you fell over and they're picking you up when you couldn't get up on your own. That's mercy. They're delivering us from something, from the consequences or the penalty of what happened. God, if we look at what's going on here, is the giver of patience in the first place in order that we might respond to the mercy that he's also the giver of. And he actually, if we want to just throw on the icing on the cake, he's the giver of the Holy Spirit who allows us the capacity to respond at all in the first place to any of his mercy. All kinds of things can go on, but it's the patience of the Lord in the midst of that that's an invitation to us to come to him regardless of the circumstances around us because he has mercy to deliver. We heard this passage this morning, but this rounds it out nicely, I think. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Which, as we kind of bring it to a close here, brings us to, I think, another scary question. Why does Jesus need to use so much patience with us? I, I direct that at me, not just you, just so you know. I appreciate that Paul puts himself in this category too. Paul says, I was the worst of sinners. I did all this stuff. We all need the patience of Christ extended to us. Some, some of us need the patience of Christ extended to us because we're too prideful. We don't see the need for mercy because we've put ourselves in the seat of judgment already. We've put ourselves in complete and total control. Or, in that control that we have, we are able to diagnose and judge everything else and everybody else around us, and we're really good at it, but we never turn the finger towards ourselves. We need to be introspective enough to recognize when our pride puts us in the seat of Christ instead of Christ in the seat of Christ. And this is one of those where the easiest test is when somebody brings it up, if you think they're talking to someone else, turn the finger inward at that point, right? I need to do the exact same thing. I can be prideful too. It, and, and we need to recognize, we need to be introspective on this one because Christ humbles the proud so they can humbly live for Christ. But sometimes the fall from the pedestal hurts. The other thing, the other, another reason that Christ needs so much patience with us, I think, is sometimes we can be people who don't think ourselves worthy of Christ's mercy at all. We actually think too lowly of ourselves. We are so introspective, we're lost inside of ourselves, and we think, oh, okay, I can't even love myself very well or know what's going on. How in the world can Christ do that to me? Now, before I go on with, with a thought on that, I also want to say this. Uh, for those of us that can be prideful, sometimes we can live like we look like this so that we don't have to answer the tough questions. So again, be introspective so you don't do that. But if you think so uh, too lowly of yourself, if you're too lost in yourself to say, well, how, why, is, why would Christ even think of me? Why would he even care to think of me? Why would he even do anything? I, I don't even think that highly of myself. Remember that the immense mercy of the Lord is indeed for you. It's for all of us. There is joy in the Lord because he takes joy in his creation, including you. That's good news. And both the path of the proud and the path of the unworthy are paths that lead to chaos, not clarity. 
they're both dangerous paths. They're both paths like what Paul's charting out here. If we, if we simply live under the law and not under the grace of Christ and receiving his mercy. And that's why Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying. Write this down. Underline it. Remember it. Put it in your journal. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that includes me. When we walk with him, we, lead, we can lead a life of truth and love that leads towards clarity and not chaos and be rescued because his patience is immense. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to begin just taking silence. And in the silence, just looking inward and recognizing our own pride meter and our humility meter. And recognizing if we are, in fact, putting ourselves in the seat of Christ in our own lives, Lord, forgive us when we do that, because we all, we all do that. And Lord, for those that aren't sure that we're worthy of your grace and your mercy, may your spirit work and draw us to you so that we recognize that indeed in the brokenness around us, you reach in and give us mercy so that we can be made whole again. God, I'm grateful for your immense patience towards us. Let us not abuse that patience, but use it well and receive it as an invitation to come into your presence, to live in truth and love. All this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. sing in response, so I'd invite you to stand as we sing about God's goodness. I love you, Lord. All your mercies never fails me. All my days have held in your from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are no sly, no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I 
ever sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. From the end of our passage today, there was a benediction there. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.